Welcome to What It's Like Podcast. My name's Kaylee Ashlyn. I got Sasha. I don't even know your last name. Coles. Anymore. It's just Coles. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, it's an honor to have you here. I Well, it's an honor to be at your house doing this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming. You've been in my house many times over the last 10, 15 years. Yeah. Yeah. You always have really cool houses. Thank um, you. <laughs> They really represent your insides. <laughs> <laughs> I just try to make them little sanctuaries so mm. that it feels good to be in them. Mm. Yeah, it definitely feels like that. Um, yeah, I've known Sasha for since I was, I guess, 14 years now. <laughs> since I was 14. Would have been, yeah. Uh, wow. Yeah. Half your life. Half my life. Um, Sasha. And you knew my dad before that. Absolutely. Yeah. I knew your dad before I knew you. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, weren't you guys both up for the position? Yes. We, we both went after the same job mm-hmm. uh, for Archway Academy of Sober High School. Mm-hmm. And I just happened to beat him out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he never let me live it down either. Yeah. <laughs> of course he wouldn't. Um, so I, I attended a sober high school uh, as a teenager, um, yeah, was sober for from 14 to 21, which was probably the best decision. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, a lot of shit in between that, but glad I um, let my brain cells develop a little. <laughs> well, and a huge part of why you got sober was because of your dad being sober mm-hmm. and everything he'd gone through, all of his struggles. So I know some of that was just the family predisposition and him kind of projecting onto you some fears and anxieties about himself and how that might live out in you. Oh yeah, for sure. I think, yeah, I think both of my parents had that because just addiction runs rampant on either side of my family. And it, it's not like, I mean, I, I was probably heading in a bad direction for sure. Um, I wasn't, you know, doing that much, but I was using it to not feel the way I felt. But I think that it was a lot deeper than that. Absolutely. Um, and, and then I look at all the things that happened, especially in the first, those first 10 years. And I think to myself often how grateful I am that you had a clear head going, going through because you had a lot of tragedy mm-hmm. happen surrounding you. Mm-hmm. And I wonder how your life would be different. Had you had I not been, yeah, and it's it's so weird seeing like it's so weird like looking back and and seeing how things kind of happened. It I don't know. I was I always get so annoyed when people are like everything happens for a reason or whatever. But it's like you can kind of see I can kind of see in my life how things lined up the way and and unfolded the way they were supposed to. Like it. I don't know. Um, not like that it, I don't, not like that my dad died and and he was supposed to die, but it was just like, you know, my, my dad died. So my dad died my freshman year of high school. You were there when my mom told me that was a weird experience. <laughs> um, very big shock. Yeah. I remember that day. I remember that day. <laughs> yeah. I'll never be able to forget that day. Mm -hmm. That was one of my hardest days as a school administrator. Yeah. You've had a lot of hard ones. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That one was, that one was especially difficult. And I remember your mom and your brother, Chris, your older brother, Chris coming up and they had this information that they needed to tell you. And they were worried that if they didn't tell you in person right away, that you would somehow hear it from someone else, from someone else, you'd start getting messages or like the information would get out or one of your younger brothers would tell you what was happening and they didn't want you to hear it from anyone but them. So I remember pulling you out of class and I pulled one of your close friends out of class. Wait, I had asked to go. I had asked to go to the chapel. I felt something. I had asked. Wouldn't surprise me at all. With Katie, I had asked to go 
to the chapel. I felt something. Well, one of our, one of a, a friend in Padap that was like kind of in Padap, which Palmer Drug Abuse Program, which is what I was also a part of, she um, had passed away that week. And I wasn't that close to her, but I, I don't know. I just, it was, I, that's what I was, I guess, pinning my emotion to. Because I felt just so much anxiety and like I just couldn't pay attention in class. And I remember asking them if I could go to the chapel with Katie. And I guess somebody maybe knew already. Mm-hmm. And they were, uh, maybe I asked you or some, and they were like, yeah. And I was like, oh, they're going to let me go. <laughs> and it was like after I had skipped school or something the day before. And I was like already like in trouble. And like <laughs> I was like, oh, they're going to let me go. That's cool. They must know I'm going through it. And I had no idea. And then I remember my mom, you guys walked in. I was like, what is going on? Like, just. And immediately your face went pale. Yeah. But even before she said the words. Yeah. I was like, wait, what? Yeah. It just, it just, yeah. Yeah. That's, it's, it's wild. I mean, I've I've been through a lot of deaths since then. I feel like everyone kind of changes you a bit, you know? And. I feel like people get so scared of the idea of death. And I feel like I've, I've been forced to make friends with it, right? <laughs> I've been forced to. Um, but it's kind of allowed me to like not be so scared of the word or the idea or just, and, and it's so funny how we fear it. We all fear it and we'll, we'll, we will all face it, right? It's just it is a 100% guarantee mm-hmm. that we will all have to face the death of a loved one and then our own mortality mm-hmm. eventually. Yeah. Yeah, and that's so many people <laughs> run from that, I feel, you know. And and I and I notice it in how isolated I feel in situations of grief, I guess. Um when you're not around the people you're experiencing it with or when you're around people that don't really understand or aren't close enough to feel it. Um, it kind of feels like a, it's like one of those things, you know, you bring up and then people change the subject or they're, you know, want to make a joke or deflect. I just told somebody the other day, I was like, yeah, humor can be used as healing, but it can also be used as deflection. Absolutely. And I don't like to use it as deflection. Well, and we're in a culture right now, I believe, full of people that don't know how to sit with sadness, mm-hmm. that don't know how to sit with grief, that don't know what to do with it. And so we're deflecting like crazy, mm-hmm. shutting down conversations, changing the topic really quickly, using humor to deflect uncomfortable feelings, um, d- figuring out any way to move away from the topic or the conversation. Um that's been the hardest for me as someone who works a lot with grief and death is how difficult it is to find safe space to talk about death and grief. Um, Because I know how uncomfortable it makes other people Mm -hmm. when I bring up something that my soul has got to talk about. Right. I know if I don't talk about it or if I don't process it or if I don't bring it up or if I don't share what's going on with me, then I just take it underground and then it ends up hurting me. Right. Um, but how sad that we live in this culture that seems to be so progressive and seems to be like, we can talk about anything. Mm-hmm. And um, that's still one area of the life cycle that we as a culture have a lot of difficulty talking about. Which is so interesting because it's how long, you know, how long we've been here and how we really don't have that many like absolute truths. Like that is one of the only absolute truth that we have known since the beginning of time. You know, yet we do so little to prepare ourselves to talk about it with our children. I mean, I talk to people constantly who aren't sure if they should let their their children under the age of fifteen or sixteen attend a funeral of a grandparent or attend a funeral of a parent. <laughs> um, it's because they don't know. Like, am I going to hurt this kid? Am I going to wound this kid? It's yeah, like, no. It, if you, you don't talk about it, <laughs> I mean, yeah. Like, obviously, the situation. Like, I mean, losing my dad and at at 15 was absolutely horrible. But like the, the community I had like literally carried me through that. And like, and I was, and I think it's, it's also difficult coming from a place like Archway where, 
you can talk about that shit. And, and people are talking about it because they're experiencing it as well. And it's, and sometimes we talked about <laughs> too much, but it was okay to talk about whatever you were feeling or whatever in it. And coming out of that, and I want to, I, I was like, am I oversharing? Am I, is it me or whatever? But I'm like, I feel like the only way to remove stigma is to talk about it, right? And that, and like how, I I am grateful that I had such a good community, like when losing my dad and, and um, everything. But like, what about the people that don't have that? And what about the people that don't have, don't have anybody that's going to talk about it or, or people that are going to gaslight you about it or, um, or people who are going to be uncomfortable with the hard words that you have to say and then want you to move on really quick. I mean, that's the thing that irritates the crap out of me is when people want grief to be in this really pretty timeline Mm -hmm. for someone that they love right? and even for their own grief, but especially when it's someone that they love and it's like, you know, you just can't hold on to this forever. Right. You know, it's really important that you just move on. Like we just need to return to normal life, but life will never be normal again. Mm. Now there's this huge gaping hole absence Mm. of a person that you loved deeply that isn't there anymore. And so you have to make peace with that for sure. I mean, you have to figure out how to, how to integrate that loss into your life. Um, But because we're not expert grievers, because we don't talk about grief, death and dying openly, um, like we're a bunch of uneducated people walking around dealing with a really hard subject, feeling like we don't have the tools and trying to keep it under the radar and trying to make it so nobody else can see it. Right. Cause we want to have this like perfect because our grief is so uncomfortable for other people. Right. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I get it. I get it. I mean, loving somebody that's grieving is like so incredibly hard, especially when you're like, when you have a connection and stuff with them. Like I, like my mom, like I struggle being around her when, I mean, there's times when we can both flow through it together, but then there's times where I'm like, man, I'm taking on your grief and you're taking on mine. And this is just a mess. Like it's not cause you want to help. You don't want people to feel like, you know, <laughs> that I guess bad, but I think that's maybe a thing too, where we think, that like grief is like a bad emotion. Yeah, or grief is something to be fixed in people. Right. Like what is what should I do to lighten their load or what mm-hmm. should I what can I do to fix this for that person or what could I say or what can I bring or what can I do when people who are grieving don't need any fixing. They need people willing to sit with them mm-hmm. while they process whatever their process is going to look like. And yours will be different from mine right. and your mom's will be different from yours. Mm-hmm. And two siblings who lost a father, both of their grief will look different. Yeah, And so it's just about sitting still with someone and like letting that sacred grieving process unfold for them uniquely for them mm-hmm. and then helping to figure out Right. Like, what do I do to support you? But it's, I mean, I I think people don't know what to do with grief and what we want to do with everything that we don't understand or that scares us is we want to either deny it or fix it. Mm-hmm. Um, and grief cannot be denied or fixed. Nope. It's just a process that unfolds for people naturally in, in God's perfect timing for them. Right. Yeah. And there are people who delay grief for extended periods of time, which is also the right thing for them. Sometimes you got to, sometimes you got to just like you have jump in that survival some, exactly. mode because that's the only thing you can do. And then there are people who dive into it head first in a way that is so scary to witness mm-hmm. that people who love them start to back away. It's like kind of traumatizing to watch, even, <laughs> yes. you know, <laughs> <laughs> and all of those are the right way to do it. I mean, who am I to say right. to anyone else, this is too much or this is not enough or you're not doing it the right way. Mm-hmm. Like, I think it really goes into just it's it's deeper than than death. It's it's like allowing people to feel the way they feel even if it doesn't make sense to you. Just allowing you know, so so I after losing my brother to suicide in 2019, um I wrote this thing. It was actually after another friend, Xavier passed away. I wrote this letter about suicide that was like really freaking raw. Um, And I was working at 
um, a psychiatric hospital at the time and I was on the suicide prevention work group and they asked me to do an email. So I was like, all right. And I wanted, I wanted to put that letter in there and just put it in, in the beginning and I like fix it up, made it like, you know, professional or whatever, you know, didn't have, didn't have any F bombs in it or whatever. Um, but it was raw emotion and they're working at a, it's a state psychiatric facility. So it's like people like not guilty by reason of insanity and stuff. Like people have been through shit. And, you know, so I, I was like, I'm going to attach a bit of this letter and, and write it in. And I sent it to the superintendent and she was like, yeah, it's too raw. And she's like, it might trigger somebody. And I'm like, trigger who? My brother killed himself. (laughs) Trigger somebody else that thinks I should feel a different way about it. Well, and and in some ways, like, so it wouldn't, I don't believe that your words would trigger people. I believe that your words would make people feel. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're avoiding. Right. Yep. We don't want, but I want, I wanted my words to, yeah, maybe make people feel, but also let let people, this is what I want to do with this. This is what I want to do with my life is make people feel okay to speak make people feel it's okay to feel exactly how you feel. It doesn't have to make sense. You, it, you can't control it. That's how you feel. I feel like we want to control our emotions and how we come off and how, when we don't know why we feel the way we feel all the time. And I'll get these weird, and I get these weird premonitions sometimes where I feel stuff before it comes. I said the day before my brother committed suicide, I think before he even decided, I told my friend, I feel like somebody's going to die today. I think I reached out to you that day. You did. I remember. And I was just like, hey, I love you. I was just texting everybody I could think of. Hey, I love you. Hey, I love you. I just, I felt it. And I, there's, there's so much in this world that I feel like we can't understand. Right. And we we can explain and mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense in our brains, but we do feel it in our souls. We, We feel it in our bodies in a very different way. Yeah. But we don't have a lot of conditioning of of what to do with that or how to trust it. Mm-hmm. Um, so we dismiss it. Yeah. We were like, "Oh, that's not what that was," or "Oh, it's th- it's just anxiety," right. or we misinterpret what it is because we're not used to trusting our own gut instincts or mm-hmm. trusting our intuition, um, or because we think, "Oh God, if I say this out loud, people are going to think I'm fucking crazy." Right. So we just bottle it up and keep it inside. When most of what we sense and feel, especially during times of hardship or tragedy or coming towards hardship or tragedy. Um, I mean, that's when we're probably most connected to spirit and most connected to our higher power or God right. or whatever it is, that, yeah. however people want to call it, um, where the the veil is the thinnest between what we're doing here and where we were before and where we're going next. And yeah. I think that's another part of death and dying that makes people so uncomfortable yeah. is the not knowing, the not understanding. I mean, people have ideas and theories about what happens to people after they die, but we're even uncomfortable talking about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask you something about well, your perception of me as a teenager? Because this is, I don't, I don't know. I have so many perceptions of <laughs> yeah, you as a teenager. I would love yes. to hear them all, honestly. <laughs> uh, I feel like, I feel like I've all. I feel like my veil's always been thin. Yes, you've been an old soul from the day I met you when you were fourteen. Yes, <laughs> um, you were the oldest person at Archway when you were the youngest person at Archway, <laughs> and you still to this day cannot get anywhere on time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so I text you. It wouldn't be me if I'm late. I don't care about time, and that, no, but it, it, like in a beautiful way, like in a yeah. in a cosmic way, like time is not important. And not to you important. My because time is my time. You're I'm there when I'm there, <laughs> living here, but really from somewhere else. <laughs> That's how I felt my whole life, and I'm like, I do, this doesn't make sense. Like it doesn't make sense. What are we doing here? And I feel like I have fought that forever and I'm still fighting it, man. <laughs> Fight the man. Because it just doesn't click with me, right? When I feel like, yeah, maybe like as a kid, maybe like my veil was thin. And and learning to having to navigate that with the world we live in, having to navigate like the hard truths and like just seeing things and 
and knowing, like, I feel like I've always known the answer to questions that people weren't asking. Like, maybe I can't do this math problem, but I can tell you why you, why your wife left you. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> As a teenager. And like, I've, it, it's hard to navigate those things. Like it's hard to um, like navigate between two worlds. It feels like almost like where it's like, Oh, I know what's important because I've seen, I've looked death in the eye, but. And I think that's what makes me crazy about the time that we're living in right now is that it shouldn't be so odd for someone to walk that fine line and have that thin veil. Like it should be something embraced. It should be a superpower. It Mm -hmm. should be this thing that we're cultivating in children, just like we're cultivating language, just like we're cultivating, you know, um, sports and all of these things. It's like, it's this, it's this hidden underappreciated superpower Mm -hmm. uh, that's very, very sacred, that's very old, that typically in other times of the world has been nurtured and passed down from generation to generation. I mean, there are cultures of people who their family has been charged with grief of an entire community. Like they're professional wailers is what they call them. Mm -hmm. So they're grievers, but Mm -hmm. their expertise is helping people when someone dies. Wow. And so it's generation after generation. It's a lineage of a family being taught I think how that's to my do that. Family. <laughs> yes, it is. Unfortunately for your family. Which is not normalized. <laughs> you you don't even know that you're doing it. And mm-hmm. so there's no like you, that it's not organized and it's not taught and it's not nurtured and you're not given extra tools and you're not being taught how to carry the heavy burden of it. Mm-hmm. You know, you're just kind of thrown into it. Right. And you have to figure it out on your own and y'all attempt to figure it out as a family. Yeah. Um, but imagine how different it would be if you were being raised in a world or in a culture right now where all of the death that has surrounded your life has made you an expert in something, uh, which makes people then come to you because you have something that they need. I think I'm make, I'm trying to make that. Well, I think that's what I'm trying that. to do. <laughs> well, cause I know, cause I feel that way. I feel like, yeah, I mean, I've tried to go to college, you know, six times and dropped out each time. Like I, and I, cause I just, I mean, it's freaking easy to me and I don't care. (laughs) I just don't care. And I'm, you know, and I, I finally like went back this last time and started actually getting into like psychology stuff. And I was like, it's so, I don't have to read anything. I don't have to, like, I just know it. (laughs) Well, and you've had life experience. Right. Through my life experience. Better and deeper than most of what you would learn in a textbook. Right. And I was like, man, I don't need a piece of paper to tell you what I know. Like, I feel like, yeah, like maybe I didn't go to school and get a piece of paper, but like my, I'm an expert in my life experience. And that we undervalue that as a community. Yes. And when something really hard happens to me, I typically scan my community Mm -hmm. to figure out who has gone through that recently and who went through that well. And those are people that I feel pulled towards. Mm -hmm. Like, getting a divorce six years ago. I mean, I looked around and I was like, who do I know that got divorced and got divorced Mm semi-healthy and has a good relationship with the person that they got divorced from and are not completely wrecking their kids through the process of getting divorced. Like, Mm -hmm. who are those people? And sadly, there weren't a lot. Yeah, no. But I found a few. People don't know how to do that. But I found a few and I like hooked onto those Mm -hmm. people. I was like, teach me everything that Mm -hmm. you learned Mm -hmm. about how to do this. Yeah. Because I'm not going to go to Barnes and Noble and just find two or three little books about divorce and read them and, you know, like, show show me the real. Like, what is it? What am I missing? What do I not see? What is coming mm-hmm. for me that I need to anticipate? Call me out on something if I'm... Yes. Mm-hmm. Like what philosophies have you been living by during this difficult time? And so I think, I mean, divorce is like a version of death right. in some ways. Yeah. And so I think we need to be looking for people in our communities that have been through that hard stuff. And there is a difference between someone who experiences a tragic sudden death versus, I mean, because you've had two father figures pass in your life in two very different ways. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So your dad was an unexpected mm-hmm. passing. You did not see that coming. Right. Bill's passing, your stepdad, totally different. Mm-hmm. Terminal illness, there was time. You mm-hmm. knew that he was dying. He was progressively getting sicker and sicker. I got to like, say everything I wanted to say. You had time to kind of make peace, so yeah. to speak, with that situation. 
uh, there were opportunities for you to be with your family. You guys knew it was coming. It was a slow moving train, mm-hmm. but you all knew that it was coming. That's a very different way to lose a person. Yeah, absolutely. Then, I mean, they're both very hard mm-hmm. and they're both hard for different reasons, but those are not the same deaths. No, they're not. They're completely different. And, and suicide death then also oh my comes God. <laughs> That's just with, because you different. have a brother and a grandmother yeah. that have both died by suicide and you know better than anybody that those deaths feel really different and Mm -hmm. the death of a person who dies young feels different than the death of a person who dies old i mean there's so many things that make death unique Mm -hmm. so i know for me when tragedy hits i'm constantly looking around and scanning for people who understand and i don't mean people who understand because they wrote a book about it or um, have a certain kind of degree about it although those people can be helpful to me i'm looking for and scanning for people who have survived Mm -hmm. that upset tragedy um, life-changing soul-changing experience and are doing it in a way that like sits well mm-hmm. with my philosophies about right life right with your values and your, yes. yeah absolutely yeah i feel i feel like i mean each death has taught me something i think it's also a thing people don't talk about is is like during those i feel like when i've gone through different deaths i i'm also grieving a version of myself that i lost with that person hundred percent, you know, like I'm never going to interact with somebody the same way. And I, and I not, and just know, knowing somebody that has died and loving somebody that has died makes you see the world differently in a way. Well, and thank God. Yeah. I mean, wouldn't it be terrible? I mean, I think about my own life and death, Mm -hmm. like how shitty would it be Mm -hmm. to to die and to have your passing not impact people. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, yeah, absolutely. So like, yes, what, what is it? It, it yeah. should significantly shift us. Right. It should change, change us. us. It should teach us something. Mm-hmm. It should make us uncomfortable as hell. Mm-hmm. It should make us reevaluate our choices and how we're living and what our relationships look like. And right. I mean, I don't think it's an accident that Bill passed and you quit your job. Right. All I know. in a very short period of very time. Very short period of time. You know, and I'm not saying that you cognitively thought like, oh, this is a good time for me to reevaluate my priorities or evaluate how I'm spending my time or am I at a place where I feel well, valued I, or do our, you yeah. know, values line up. But I mean, you did. Mm-hmm. Well, I, it was a very quick thing with my job. I mean, it, it's a stressful job, a hard job, but I, I got talked to in a way by my direct superior that I knew what wasn't going to, I wasn't going to be able to continue to be productive and hold my values in that position anymore with whatever trickle down pressure coming to but me. But think of the hundreds of people who would still be there. Right. Yeah. Like, even though they also well, I've were been like, through I don't like enough, to you like that. I've been through enough shit to know mm-hmm. my values and mm-hmm. my worth. And I am bringing my, I am bringing my most authentic and, and pure self to that job for my patients. And if you're not going to support me in that, then I'm not going to be able to do it. And I just knew that. And I, and I felt it in my body and it was weird. It was, I mean, I didn't think the day before I would, I didn't think that hour before that I was going to put my keys and badge down, but it's, it's part of that stuff. That's like, Sometimes everything happens the way it's, or things happen the way they're supposed to. They kind of all line up. And then like how I was, my mom was telling me, you know, like it's, it's getting soon. Like Bill's really sick and he's starting to like not mentally be here, you know? And I was like, well, like I had a bunch of stuff going on for the weekend. I had a friend in town from Mexico, like, for my birthday and like, you know, like I had life, I was still doing life, you know? And, um, last Friday night I had a dream because, so I had asked Bill, I had asked Bill, my stepdad, whenever, um, it started, I was like, let me know when she needs me. Let me know when mom needs me and I'll be here. Cause she might not let me know. Cause she's not very good at t- saying, I need you. She's like, come if you want. I'm fine, you know, one of those, but which is fine. I get it. I'd probably do the, I probably do the same shit, which is why (laughs) I'm fine. I got it. I'm a, I can deal with it myself. I'm strong. (laughs) I do the same shit. And that's why it pisses me off. (laughs) But 
I, I had a dream or something on Friday night and I could hear Bill saying, I'm waiting for you. And I just, like, I, I got up in the middle of the night and I almost just started packing, packing up. up and going. And then I was like, it's the middle of the night and I'm tired. <laughs> like, let me, let me go back to sleep and, and do this in the morning. And yeah, I just woke up and, and headed out and we did a little, um, well, when I got, I was rushing there thinking, oh my God, he's waiting on me. Like he's waiting to die for me. Like not, he wants to make sure that you're there so that your mom has the right. support that you, that she needs. He knew, so like, I know can. that he knew that I was the support that she needed. I don't think anybody else could have been there during that time. And I think it was always supposed to be me and her. Um, there and so I'm I'm rushing there and I get there and then there's like two friends there and a sister there and they're they're talking about I don't know something not <laughs> not about what's in, you know he's there like almost dead he looks dead and they're they're talking about shopping or whatever people talk about and I was like oh it's not gonna happen right now he's not gonna feel safe right now um, and I hugged my mom and I was like, he told me he was waiting on me, like started sobbing. And then everybody like left. <laughs> They're like, them, okay, okay. <laughs> Kaylee's here. <laughs> it's going to get weird. <laughs> um, but it was really nice. We, I played him some of his favorite songs. I got to talk to him by myself for a sec and like, you know, just was like, Hey, I made it. I'm here. You're mm -hmm. good. Like. You did it's so okay. good. Thank you so much for like everything you did for my mom. You did so good. Like it's okay. And we played him some music and just hung out. And then um, my younger brother left and it was just me and my mom. And she fell asleep on the couch holding his arm. And I was laying on the couch watching a movie, which is wild. We were watching a movie Into the Wild. Oh, yeah. Which we had never seen. It just popped up, and the main character's name is Christopher, same name as my brother, and he dies from starvation, which is which is how Bill, yeah, yeah, because ultimately he couldn't, dies, couldn't really eat. It's just, and, and I feel like the more I trust myself and this weird stuff or whatever's going on in my body, mm -hmm. the more the more things make sense. More things make sense, and I was saying to my boss. The day before I quit my job, I said, I feel like I'm going to have to do something big and brave. <laughs> I just I was like, something big is going to happen. I'm going to have to do something big and brave. It's just weird, dude. And I feel like, I don't know, but it's, it's weird. It, it, it makes more sense the more I trust it. So it's like, why can't we just say like, okay, maybe that's a, just a type of, well, and a the more life, right? the more you trust it, the louder it speaks to you, mm -hmm. and the easier it is to understand, and the more natural it is mm -hmm. to live your life according to what it is that in, that sense of intuition that you feel. Right. I've been asked a thousand times, like, how is it that you handle this situation or that situation or this situation? And the most honest answer I can give is, I don't know. <laughs> Um, because I'd love to be able to point you to like this quote or this like book that I read or this like training that I got or this, you know, whatever, but it's, I can't, it's just this thing that I know, like, I don't know how I know it. I just know, right. like, I know when I'm supposed to call and what I'm supposed to do and mm -hmm. how long to sit in silence. And so I just feel it in your body. Like, yeah, and it you just, just kind of like follow a, what you feel led to do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not being led by intellect. I think it's being led by something much different than that. I like, you know, I feel like I'm, I am pulled a lot by my grandmother's. Mm -hmm. You know, like don't go down that street or I mean, sometimes mm -hmm. it is stuff like go this other way or avoid this thing or don't go to this event or right. um, or reach out to this person. They're mm -hmm. like in a really dark place right now or just whatever it is. Yeah. And so the more I nurture that, the more I listen to it and the more I kind of like follow its direction, so mm -hmm. to speak, the clearer, the clearer it is. 
feels to me. Mm -hmm. And then the more I do it and the more I feel like my life and my choices are all kind of lined up, Mm -hmm. you know, and my, and I feel more sense of calm and peace in my life and things like that, then the, the easier it is to believe it. Right. Yeah. I think a lot of it too is, um, just, uh, like holding space for yourself too. I think that's a big part of it. Like it's important for other people to do that for you too, but learning how to do that for yourself, hold space for yourself and, and allow yourself to f- feel how you feel and, le- and learning how to flow through that. And, and like I was saying earlier, like people think grief is a bad thing. Grief is a beautiful representation of, of, of losing love. someone that you love. Like it, and, and, you know, sadness and tears aren't, uh, the, one thing I say all the time, crying is releasing. It's not bad. You just got to get it out. And you, it's just like you have to get out a laugh or a fart. <laughs> you got to yeah. get it out, man. Well, and if you don't, then you end up experiencing like physical and emotional consequences yeah. to holding that kind of stuff in, you mm-hmm. know? I mean, it's like, it's like if you got a stomach virus. And like you needed to have diarrhea and you needed to vomit because Mm -hmm. you have this poison inside you, this virus inside you that needs to exit your body for your own safety and well-being. Mm -hmm. It's taking that physical kind of metaphor and putting it into a spiritual, emotional Mm -hmm. context. So that stuff just builds up and builds up and builds up and has to be released. And if we don't release it in ways that are healthy, then we end up releasing it in other ways. Like we end up releasing it through our bodies being sick mm. or our thoughts being spiritually unwell or dude, I felt whatever sick most of my life. I felt sick all of high school. <laughs> I did. I felt sick all of, all of school. I really did. It was hard. Like I wasn't just bitching for no reason. I wasn't just late for no reason. I was tired and I felt sick. I felt physically ill. And you had really heavy things happening in your life really heavy things Mm -hmm. yeah i mean how many people do you know honestly that have that had to lose a parent in their teens probably not a lot yeah maybe a couple how many people do you know who have lost a sibling to suicide you probably know more of those people now yeah. than you did at the time that Chris passed mm-hmm. because you've been doing all this advocacy work and putting mm-hmm. yourself out there so that you can meet other people like you all are attracting yeah. each other right now. Mm-hmm. But those are very unique life experiences. Yeah. And, and that, they happened in a very short, I mean, those were only four years apart. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. you were barely coming up for air from your dad's passing. That's how it's felt every time. Yeah. That's how it's felt. Well, that's every what time. it is. <laughs> Yeah. Why? (laughs) I mean, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, and I think, yeah, and there's been such an uncomfortable, I feel like so many people get uncomfortable around me or they did, you know, especially like right after Chris died, like it's just like, they don't, you know, I started getting that look all the time that, you know, like people don't know how to act around me and people would just stop talking to me because they didn't know. Well, they weren't sure if they should come around you and be happy or if that was like disrespectful Mm -hmm. to be happy around you because you were going through such a tough time and they Mm -hmm. didn't know what to say. And I think people avoid people who are grieving, not because they don't love that person, but it's because they are so afraid that they're going to do the wrong thing. I I really do believe Mm -hmm. that people have the intention to want to love and support people that are in a hard grieving spot, but they have no clear sense of what they're supposed to do or say. And so it's easier to avoid that person than it is to risk putting yourself out there and then making a mistake or saying Mm -hmm. the wrong thing or be it's, it's almost like when people are dying and I had this conversation with your mom and with Bill a few weeks before he passed away. Um, A lot of times what happens is the person who's dying doesn't want to talk about all the things that they're feeling about knowing that they're going to die because Mm -hmm. they don't want the people who will be left to feel uncomfortable yeah. and the people who are not dying but supporting the dying person don't want to talk about their feelings because they don't want to make the dying person uncomfortable and so everyone avoids what they naturally know they should do they mm-hmm. don't do it because they're worried about making the other person uncomfortable and then what sadly ends up happening is everyone's uncomfortable mm-hmm. 
So yeah, fuck it. Yeah. Let's just have fuck the hard it. Let's just have it because yeah, it's bad. like I told your mom, tell Bill everything that you're thinking and yeah. feeling. If it, it's not, it won't make him uncomfortable. Maybe it'll make That's him feel gonna... deeply loved and appreciated right. because you're having such a difficult time with everything happening with him. Mm -hmm. And Bill, if you want to talk about hoping that your son Dylan will come to get you and will take your soul when it's time for you to leave, talk about those things. Mm -hmm. Like, and who cares if it makes other people uncomfortable? My guess is it actually won't. We're all kind of thinking the same stuff anyway. Right. Yeah. In some ways. Yeah. But we're so afraid of making other people uncomfortable that we don't do the things that are intuitively natural for us. I love to make people do. uncomfortable. I do too. It's one of my favorite things <laughs> on the planet. And honestly, I love being, I love being uncomfortable. Yeah. Cause it feels real. Well, it's better than the, the elephant in the room and the, mm. you know, feeling like I'm walking on eggshells or feeling so nothing. Um, well, that's not true. I can, nothing irritates me more. There's plenty of things that irritate me, but, um, I have a lot of difficulty going to funerals, um, that are over professional, overly religious funerals where I really just feel like I went to a Sunday service mm -hmm. and they mentioned the name of the person who I love who has died one time. Right. Or two times. Mm -hmm. And it's not about their life and it's not about grieving and people aren't having feelings. Yeah. And there's no stories being told. And well, it's Bill's like, having a mass. So. I know. <laughs> and he's also having a celebration. And yeah, we're going to, yeah. we'll do a celebration for him after. But, but <laughs> because then I don't feel like I have any sense of closure. Like I go to those ceremonies because I want to be uncomfortable. That's the mm -hmm. whole reason to go. To, to, I want to go to be it. stirred up, mm -hmm. to be stirred up to miss that person. Mm -hmm. I know this is going to sound weird. And this is the stuff that chokes me up. But like, I want to go and I want to sit and I want to watch a widow mm. grieve her husband mm. because that makes me feel alive. It makes me appreciate my spouse more or mm -hmm. my child more. Mm -hmm. Is it difficult to watch? Mm -hmm. 100%. Mm -hmm. Was it hard to sit and watch you grieve your dad? Mm -hmm. Oh my God, yes. But it was like a necessary part of my growth as a person because yeah. I love you yeah. and care about you and care about your family and I knew what you were going through. Um. So I think there's something magical and beautiful and necessary about showing up big yeah. for people in grief. Yeah. And confronting how uncomfortable it is uh -huh. to be at a funeral, to see a person's body. Um, I mean, those are all really uncomfortable things that we spend a lot of time avoiding. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, man, I don't, I, I don't know. I have such a mixed feeling about, funerals and and you know a lot of my family was cremated and i i'm okay with that and i you know i had, bill was the first person i've like actually seen you know he passed while i was there yep and it wasn't as weird as i thought it was it's not as weird as them being in a casket i hate that that does not look right <laughs> well and part of probably what was different is because you know bill was in his home in his yeah. living room in a space that was safe for you and he just and he, he was just like with he was you just guys. asleep he didn't nothing happened he just stopped breathing he just mm -hmm. that was it that was just eyes closed just stopped breathing so he looked exactly the same as he did right before um just started to get a little pale and cold and but it and people are overwhelmed with anticipation and fear and anxiety about what's going to happen when a person dies. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and when they pass in a way similar to Bill, you know, from terminal illness, it tends to be a very peaceful transition. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not the same as a car accident or like another way that a person might die where there'd be more like trauma, <clears throat> more trauma to their body or, mm -hmm. you know, it would be scarier to kind of look at a body. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, after a tragic type of passing. Um, and then I, I know because I know you, um, you know, and I saw a picture that you had posted of the top of Bill's head with the flowers. And like, those are some of the most loving, nurturing things that we can do, mm -hmm. you know? And that's a way that we just honor like this vessel that his soul has been in. Mm -hmm. And I think people are very uncomfortable talking about like, where is Bill now? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, because everyone has a different opinion or they haven't thought it through all the way or all they remember is what they were taught from when they were a child mm -hmm. about what, you know, their religion has taught them about what happens when people pass. And that's hard mm -hmm. and scary too. Yeah. 
And so our emotions are mixed with our sadness and our grief about this person passing. You know, I'm sure you're thinking, oh my God, is my mom going to be okay? What does she need? So you're distracted from your own process by being worried about your mom. And then you've got your brothers and then Mm -hmm. you've got Bill's family. Mm -hmm. And then you've got everyone's thoughts and feelings to take into consideration, which you do because you're an empath. And so you're constantly scanning other people (laughs) to figure out how they do it. I definitely feel more for other people than I do myself. Yes. (laughs) I will think about the way somebody views my life and cry about that before I think about my my actual how I feel about my life. Um, and and I think that you know when we talk about suicide death um, and just stigma around death in general, but especially stigma around suicide death, I think that's when people really get uncomfortable talking about what they think happens to a person's soul. Yeah, and everyone's thinking it and everyone is sort of internally wrestling with it, but we're not having a lot of honest, open conversations with each other about it. Right. Well, yeah. And we, and there's like these absolutes, right? Because of like religion or whatever, like, Oh, when you do this, when you, when you kill yourself, you go to hell or whatever, you're in purgatory or whatever. It's like, I, I don't know, man. Like, why do we, you don't know anything about that. We don't, we don't, um, what is, is it Socrates who says, like, I, I am, they, they ask him what, what death is. And he goes, death is not where I am and I am not where death is or something. It's just, I can't, I don't know. Cause I'm not there yep. basically. Um, and, and I think that's just such a, a freeing part of that is, is, that one thing that's helped me so much is me saying, I don't know. Yes. And approaching death with curiosity Mm -hmm. instead of with these absolutes. Right. Mm -hmm. But I know, I know that I feel a connection still to somebody that's not here. I know that that's real. I know I can hear Danielle fucking, (laughs) she's fucking with my life (laughs) for sure. But like in the best way possible, you know, I can feel her. Um, yeah, I mean, you've known everybody close to me that has died. <laughs> you have known everybody close to me that's died. Um, but that was a big changing one for me, too. Absolutely. If she was one of your best friends, mm-hmm. one of your best childhood friends. And then you all grew apart but always stayed connected. Mm-hmm. I mean, you'd go months without speaking to each other, mm-hmm. yet would talk I mean, to each other. she always felt like, like my sister. She yeah. was your sister, yeah. 100%. And she died in a in just in a very unusual, unexpected way. I mean, you had time to prepare. I mean, mm-hmm. you knew that... You knew that she was likely. She going was to the pass. first one I got to sit with, and I got to sit mm-hmm. with her and hold her hand and tell her what she meant to me, and tell her it's okay, and I'm here to help you do whatever you want to do, if that's fight or if that's leave. And I was able to do that, and um, yeah, Medium had to- told me that she was helping me in life now because. I helped her feel safe to transition. Um, and, and, and Kaylee, think of all of the, the people, think of some of the other people who didn't show up to that hospital because they didn't know what to do and they didn't know what to say. I knew I had to And be because there. your life has been touched so many times by death, you didn't give yourself that option. You were like, I'm going. I'm mm-hmm. going. It'll be weird. It'll be hard. I don't know what will happen. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't know what I'm supposed to say. But you were just willing to walk in with some faith. I wouldn't be me if I didn't. I feel like I... And I think that's why so many people don't feel like themselves. Mm. You know, and I did. I think I did go through a few years like that after Chris died. I think I had to. Of Just, just out, out of protection. Yeah, just, just going into survival mode. Um, and yeah, out of protection, out of survival, out of... I mean, it was, it's too much. And then, I mean, well, Chris died and then, you know, stepbrother Dylan died nine months later. And the day before, the day before Dylan died, I went to therapy for the first time and said, okay, I'm ready to start talking about Chris. And then the next day Dylan died and I, you know, immediately went into a panic attack. And I remember my therapist, I called her. And she was like, okay, just think about the next thing you need to do. If you need to eat, eat. You need to smoke a cigarette, smoke a cigarette. You need to use a restroom, use a restroom. You need some water, drink some water. And I think it snapped me out of my panic attack. And then I was in between panic attack and survival mode for probably the next few years. (laughs) 
you know, um, with some, you know, sprinkles of other stuff in there. But, um, yeah, I stopped being myself. Well, and this is a huge part of your spiritual path. I mean, your life has been touched significantly by death in a way that I think is very unusual for most people. Mm -hmm. And so all of the lessons that come from that and everything that you've learned about yourself and all the pain that you've had to experience, but then all of the life, all of the enjoyment that has come to your life by looking at your life with it, with a different lens, with mm -hmm. a different perspective, because you know, the vulnerability, um, you know, how, how delicate life is in a way that a lot of other people haven't had to experience yet. Right. They just lose their grandparents. They use, they lose old people and pets and things like that, right. but they don't experience like losing a same age sibling. They don't experience losing a best friend. Mm -hmm. They're not surrounded by people who have died from overdoses and mm -hmm. are in communities like that. And so you have like a unique gift given to you by life experience mm -hmm. that a lot of people just haven't had yet. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I tell people when they're like, oh my God, I can't, you know, the amount you have been through. I'm like, you're going to go through it too. Oh, we all will. You will, will go through it too. It is an absolute. And then, you know, I used to be like, and then when I was stuck in those survival years, I was like, you know, very, I was like, I'm, I don't believe in anything. I mean, just, I mean, having, <laughs> having your brother shoot himself in the backyard will just, pull the rug out from under your life. And just, it's just, it, nothing makes sense anymore. Nothing checks out, nothing matters, nothing. And it just felt like, I felt like I had to survive for my mom because, you know, she can't have another kid that kills themselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I just have to, I'm going to fucking be the most depressed. Semi-functioning person. Semi-functioning person that doesn't believe in anything because it, for the rest of my life, because that's just the way it is. It just, just the way my life unfolded. Right. And I, I broke out of that. It, it took a lot of fighting, but I broke out of that eventually. And then it took a lot of unique people coming into my life, people coming in and out of my life and, and open, opening different doors and, and letting me view things in a different way. And, and it, you know, over the last couple of years, my life's completely changed where I, I never thought I could look back on my life and be grateful that I have had the experience I had, but I am so grateful for the life experience and knowledge I have to be able to articulate things and, and explain things to people. And I feel, I do feel like an expert in grief and I'm, I have a partner right now that's struggling to learn how to be there for me because he hasn't had to do this, but I'm able to say, look, you need to make, help me feel safe. Here's how you can help me feel safe. I need to feel safe to feel exactly how I feel. I don't need to joke right now. And when I need to joke, I will. But it's like, I, I need that space. And if you can't sit here with me in that space, then I can't be around you right now. And that's just the end of that. So, but so I, but I have had enough live experience to know what I need and ask for it at 27 years old. That's pretty, pretty remarkable. I mean, a lot of people don't have that and I I'm grateful and I'm also grateful for the thing. I mean, working at the psych hospital for the past year and, and have how many times patients told me things they never told anybody or, you know, like opened up to me in a way or, or cried with me or what, I, like, I couldn't, I couldn't do that if I hadn't survived everything I did and, and, w and sat with myself through the uncomfortable shit. And had people sit with you to show you what's possible. I mean, that's what it I is. Mean, Cause you, it's just a circular thing. Like someone does it for you so that you have what you need to do it for someone else. And then you do it for them. And then there will be a patient who is touched by you and that psych hospital who in four or five years is going to sit in a sacred way with another person and it goes on and having on and an on. experience. And it's just, that is the ripple of this. I mean, in my opinion, that's the whole purpose of why we're here, mm -hmm. you know, is to have that experience with each other, yeah. you know, to grow our souls here and figure out, what, you know, in the messiest way possible, <laughs> you know, figure out how to, how to be in our own physical bodies, which is what we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. And then how 
to have our hearts connected to each other. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of the biggest things that death and grief have taught me is that I don't know more than I do. Mm -hmm. That no two people grieve the same. Mm -hmm. And that it's one of the hardest parts of being a human Mm -hmm. is losing someone. I think that losing a person is way harder than dying. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel kind of, it's like, Hey, when I transition, I feel like there's probably something really wonderful that's about to happen. Like that's going to be fantastic. So uh, that part feels much easier Mm -hmm. than remaining, than, than being left, you Mm -hmm. know, than being here, having someone I love and care about move into whatever the next chapter is for soul growth or development, and then having to kind of sit here with your hands empty. And with our human bodies and brains and not understand, not be able to comprehend what's beyond our world. And I think that it's really magical and really beautiful when people dedicate more of their life and their time and energy into holding space for people in that hard time. Because I think it is one of the hardest things that we go through in our human experience. You know, it's a form of heartbreak, um, mm-hmm. and it feels so permanent to us, you know? Right. Because this is all we know. And we're left with all these like guilts and burdens and like, what if I would have done this? And what if I would have said this, especially when the passing is unexpected, mm-hmm. um, or the person is young, we tend to kind of like have all these, you know, regrets or I should have called them more. Or I didn't pick up the last time that they called. And now I'm never going to get to speak to them again. And like, did I love hard enough? And did they know how I felt about them? And remember that one time that I, I ghosted them or I mm-hmm. didn't go, go to their birthday party or whatever. I mean, we're just left with all of right. that. And so sitting with people as they're processing through all of the stuff that they feel about themselves connected to that person's passing. Because part of it is now that person's not here anymore. Our relationship with them is changing. And depending on what our belief system is, we either believe that that, that, um, that that relationship is severed or we believe it just changes into a new kind of relationship. That's my personal belief. Mm -hmm. So I believe that when I lose someone, it's just like we enter into a new phase of our relationship with each other. And Mm -hmm. it's just, it's different. It's not that every day I don't get to touch their face. I'm not looking deep into their eyes. We don't get to text and phone call each other. We don't get to take trips and see each other on holidays. My relationship with them is still very strong. It's just in a really different way. Mm -hmm. And I have to listen different and look different Mm -hmm. for how we are communicating with each other. That's my personal belief. But a lot of people don't believe that. A lot of people believe it's like this was the time that they had with this person and that time has now come to an end Mm -hmm. and the communication is like severed and cut off. This is what I talk about a lot. Like we think, we think that death is finite. We think, I mean, not death, uh, love is finite. We think that love goes away. We, we hold on to it so much because we fear that it's going to go away, right? When it's like, it's, it's everything. It's everything. It's every piece of, if, if we look for love, we can find it, right? Absolutely. If we look for hate, we can find it. But oh, if absolutely. we look for love, we can find it everywhere. And especially in times of death, um, that is the most comforting thing that Mm -hmm. we can do for people when they're grieving. Mm -hmm. Our presence, our love, um, the little, the little things that our intuition tells us to do, whether that's sending a sweet message or a text or sending their favorite flowers or Mm -hmm. sending Uber eats Mm -hmm. (laughs) or, um, sitting quiet with them or giving them space or showing up for a funeral or a service or, sending them something on Mother's Day because it's their third Mother's Day without their Mm -hmm. child or whatever it is. Like those are those small yet random significant acts of kindness that we can do for a person who's grieving Mm -hmm. that keeps our connection strong with them. And it's our way of honoring the memory of their loved one. Yeah. So when my grandfather passed in 2017, um, a whole bunch of really beautifully wonderful unexplainable things happened to me and that was the thing that pushed me to sign up for this death doula Mm. um, workshop that I did so I'm a certified death doula now which is like a birth doula it's just helping someone at the end of life instead of the beginning Mm -hmm. and I have found myself my whole life walking towards death Mm -hmm. in a way that I cannot explain and has always been very weird Mm -hmm. for me but I've always been comforted Um, like day of the dead is my favorite holiday. It was just yesterday. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's no accident that you and I are 
doing a podcast the day after my favorite day of the year, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is about honoring people that we love. That and I lost. celebrated it for the first time. Yeah. Congratulations. I'll send you with some Kopal <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> to keep the celebration them. going. Mm-hmm. My hope for us as a culture and for individual people who are like listening to the podcast um, is that we will lean more towards death and dying, Mm -hmm. that we will be less afraid of doing the wrong thing or saying the wrong thing, that we'll be more open to looking at our life within the context of we will die, Mm -hmm. one day it will happen, that we will also lose people that we love. Mm -hmm. And instead of being terrified of it and denying it and pushing it away and looking away from it, that we approach it with more love, with more curiosity, with more compassion, that we go towards those people who are who are in the midst of the hard grief Mm -hmm. and sit with them and learn whatever we can because our turn is coming Mm -hmm. to lose someone or to have our own transition. Mm -hmm. Spending an afternoon with Bill at this this time in his life, knowing that he was dying, Mm -hmm. part of the reason I wanted to go was to love and support your mom Mm -hmm. and to love and support Bill. But there was another part of me that wanted to go because Bill was meant to be a teacher for me in that moment. Mm -hmm. He's going through something that I've not had the experience of yet. And that may be the way that I pass. I don't know. We don't know. We have no control. <laughs> Nothing. So over instead it. of like, oh God, I don't know. That sounds like a really depressing afternoon to go to. You know, like, oh, I wonder what the energy would be like in the house. I mean, who cares? Mm-hmm. Like, Bill is a person who I love and care about. He's been in my life for a really long time, and I think he has something to teach me. So if we all approached death, dying, and grieving more like you were a teacher, mm-hmm. what am I meant to learn? Right. I just think we'd be a more peaceful type of people. I agree, and it, and I think you know, like moving away from these absolutes and these because really at the end of the day we. We don't we don't know and then this is what i told i told bill like when i was having a conversation with him before all this um i told him i was like you know i don't i don't know what's gonna happen or where you go i just i think that i will understand at a later date so i view i view i view death as enlightenment you know like I, it's some enlightenment that i can't know unless I, and it's like everything else. I don't know what it's like to lo- I didn't know what it was like to lose a dad till I lost a dad. Yep. I didn't know what it was like to lose my brother to suicide till I lost my brother to suicide. You know, and so on and so forth, but it's the same with death and I don't I don't know why we try to chalk it up to something and and yeah, we should be constant learners of that. Mm-hmm. You know, allow it to teach us something. Allow us because we really, we don't know why we're here. No. Like so few people question. And that's one of the hardest parts about death, I think, is the existential crisis you kind of go through mm-hmm. where you're like, your whole world shatters and you're like, what are we doing here? And then the, and the hard question is, what am I doing here? What am I doing? Like, why am I here? Yeah. And there's only a handful of things that slap you in the face with that question the way that death does. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and so that's why it is, that's why we run so far from it. Mm -hmm. Like nobody wants to sit with that. It's very uncomfortable. Yeah. (laughs) You know, sit with the pain of losing someone, sit with this, these, you know, this emptiness, you know, Mm -hmm. that you hold in your hands when a person that you deeply love and care about has transitioned. There's so many um questions that we're meant to wrestle with when death appears in our life mm-hmm. and we don't um we don't sit with that long enough in my opinion mm-hmm. so we work really hard to just put a bow on it and we put it in a box and stick it away and label it, it mm-hmm. as something or tell people like okay you know it's been long enough and mm-hmm. It's time to move on. And, you know, when are you going to be dating again? I mean, that's just like ridiculous what some yeah. people say sometimes. <laughs> um, and it most is. of those are all just out of their discomfort their comfort. Mm-hmm. with what this is like. And so, you know, that's why I just like, there's just no wrong way to do it. And people can only handle what they can handle. And I think sometimes I may look at a person and be like, oh, God, that's a fucked up way to grieve. Um, and then I just have to remember, but it's probably all they have the capacity to do right, right now. Yeah. And that's okay, too. Right. You know, understanding people, I mean, people only have their own perspective and their own life experience. And, and that can cause them to grieve and deal with situations in so many different ways. Yep. And it, I mean, it's just, I think it's just that, uh, you know, be, going through all this stuff and, and death is, 
really allowed me to say, I don't freaking know. <laughs> I don't know anything. Tell me, <laughs> you well, know? And like, what do you know? Mm -hmm. And what is your life and death going to teach me about myself mm -hmm. and teach me about how to love deeper or where to be better or whatever it is? Because when we look to someone's passing, there are all of these little golden glitters mm -hmm. that are meant to teach us about something that mm -hmm. are meant to strengthen us, mm -hmm. you know, and whatever it is that we're doing here. The, um, I planned my funeral a few years ago, oh, like wow. as part of the death doula work, you know, because how do we sit with someone and assist them in something that we haven't yet mm -hmm. done for ourselves. And I remember kind of being like, Oh God, this is going to be weird and hard. I like had the best, time, <laughs> the yeah. best time doing it. I don't know if I'm weird. I don't think I am. Um, then, or if it was just I mean, a really great activity. I'm sure I'm um, just knowing you that it would be a great activity. Oh, I mean, I wrote, <laughs> Probably be so fun, I wrote right? like this long letter. So, I mean, I have like my will put mm -hmm. together my, like all my, you know, authorization for doctors to release information to certain people. Um, like, do I want to be on life support? like all my medical directives and yeah. all that kind of stuff. So it's all, you know, I'm 45 years old. Mm. I don't plan on dying anytime soon. And you know how funny that a I lot think of people, I have any fucking control. Right. Over anyway, <laughs> a so. lot of people don't plan on dying. At all. Um, <laughs> so I've got it all ready. And it's like, I've got these pretty little manila envelopes that are like ones with my cousin and with my brother and my parents and everything. And then I have one that's for my son Cole. And um, the letter is like, you know, what they would read at the time that they discover that I've died. And it's just kind of like helpful instructions. And so part of what I, you know, put in there is, you know, I've got like really, wonderful, detailed, well thought out <laughs> ideas of like what kind of ceremony I'd like and mm -hmm. who I would like to do it and what I don't want there and what I do want there and everything. And what I really, really care about is that my son is at peace. Mm -hmm. And so if Cole wants to do anything different, 100% I am behind it. Right. But if he doesn't know what to do and it feels like a burden attempting to figure out what to do, then here is a step-by-step -step instruction mm -hmm. of what you need to do. Here's, I want to be cremated. Here's the place that you call. Here's their phone number. Yeah. I mean, it is like oh, laid yeah. out and detailed. And I, I think to myself, that might be the most beautiful gift I could give my grieving family in the event that oh, I die. Yeah, man. Because then they're not having to freaking figure that all out it in sucks. the midst of being overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. I know what kind of music I want at my funeral. I want Dr. Pepper to be served. <laughs> <laughs> I want gringos um, to cater the event. I've got the money set aside. <laughs> yeah. Like, I have my urn. I know that might sound so weird <laughs> to people, but... I, I mean, honestly, it's... And especially when somebody dies, like um when somebody dies out of nowhere right it's yeah. like oh my gosh i'm hit with this like just amazing grief and trauma and now i have to look through pictures of you and come up with a slideshow well, and, and like call what would fucking, she want yeah. and like well here here's Where what i want you want to be cremated yeah like i don't yeah. Here, yeah. Here's an instruction manual. You're just of having like just the most beautiful way to to honor me, so mm -hmm. that you don't get all caught up, and so that you don't have like my son is an only child, but like if you have multiple children, or if it's a blended family, and there's like step siblings and mm -hmm. all this kind of stuff. When people have prepared, when they haven't been so afraid of their own death, mm -hmm. to you know they've been willing to look at it and kind of wrestle with it and investigate it and nurture it and prepare for that possibility. We all should prepare to die because we're all going to die. Mm -hmm. When we lay that stuff out, we also then remove sort of the complicated situation that happens when two adult siblings cannot agree on how to lay mom to rest or blended families are having trouble figuring out does stepdad want the service in a church or, you know, at a funeral home. Mm -hmm. It's like we take away things for people to kind of get tangled up about or argue about or not be on the same page about. Yep. And and I do think that as a person who is living, that we can prepare for our own passing in ways that really are nurturing for our families. Yeah. Like when you don't have a will put together, like think of the stress and the burden that you put on your grieving family because you didn't put together some basic legal documents to mm -hmm. make them having to deal with your passing 
more peaceful and easy. Mm-hmm. So as a death doula, a lot of the time that I spend working with death and dying is helping people be prepared. It's the most loving thing they can do for their families, especially when it's terminal illness and then they then they know that it's coming. Mm-hmm. Um, but even for myself, like I, I don't have a terminal illness right now. I'm a fairly healthy person. I mean, I could drop a little weight and probably drink less soda. But mm-hmm. other than that, I'm a fairly healthy person. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think to myself all the time, like, I could get hit by a car. Right. You know? Yeah, car accident. I, anything. I mean, like, so many things could happen. Brain aneurysm. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and people. <laughs> um, and, like, I want my son to be taken care of mm-hmm. in in the in the small ways that I can take care of him after I have died, I will do that. And that's love continued. Yes. That's love continued. Absolutely. That's you loving him past beyond yourself. Yep. Which is oh, and he and I have had very weird conversations. Yeah, I'm sure you used to heart. have the weirdest conversations with him when he was little. I remember <laughs> he, he's gonna have a lot to, him to archway. He's gonna have a lot to talk about with his therapist when he's older. <laughs> yeah, um, but I mean, we've talked constantly. Like I tell him when I sense the presence of people that I love that have passed. We mm-hmm. have open conversations about that. Um, he knows that I've talked with a psychic medium before. He knows like mm-hmm. what what I think and feel and sense. Mm-hmm. Um. And so we've talked a million times, like, you know, I've told him, oh, I will come for you. Mm -hmm. When I die, I expect me in your dreams. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, like if I get the chance to know that I'm dying before I die and have a comment, like, you know, obviously I know I'm dying now. We're all just dying slowly. Um, But if I get the chance to have some conversations with him where I know I'm dying and he knows that I'm dying, like, I think, what would those conversations be? And Mm -hmm. then I try really hard to have a lot of those talks now. Yeah, You know, not in the scary context of like, oh, one day I'm going to die, honey. You know, one day I'm going to die. But we also can't pretend that's not happening. Right, yeah. Yeah. You know, I just don't want him to be blindsided either, Mm -hmm. which is why he's gone to funerals with me. Before I would rather him know, and I'd rather he and I sit at that funeral together. I don't want the first funeral that he goes to to be my funeral, right? When I'm kind of his primary support, yeah. Yeah. So we went to his best friend Jordan's funeral, uh, his best friend Jordan's grandmother's funeral, not the kid Jordan. Um, It was a Black Baptist funeral. It's one of my favorite funerals I've ever been to. Mm -hmm. Totally different than how Catholic people do funerals and how my (laughs) family does funerals. Right. Um, It was absolutely beautiful Uh and it was open casket and so we got to talk about are you comfortable going up you know i mean i think that sometimes when we're adults and we think like how do i want to prepare my children we're actually reparenting ourselves Mm -hmm. with death and dying Mm -hmm. when we start to walk our kids through those experiences that was part of the blessing of archway for me like i wasn't your parents but Mm -hmm. i was kind of in like a mentor adult person role for you oh yeah and so you know i got an opportunity to figure out where my holes were. Mm -hmm. Like when y'all needed something for me and I didn't get that from my own parents, Mm -hmm. I didn't get that in my childhood. So it was like this big gaping hole of, I don't know. Right. Then, you know, you got to teach me. And, and, and it's, and it's interesting. I feel like some of the, so much healing comes from that. Like where I, you know, I've, I found these things in my life where I, like I, there's holes there. Right. And then, then I can learn, I'm like, how do I want to, do this? How do I want to go about this? And how healing that can be being your own parent in some oh, absolutely. ways, you know? Well, especially if you just, you hadn't had that experience before. So you hadn't had your parents walk you through it, or you had your parents walk you, walk you through it in a way that was like super not helpful. And mm-hmm. Drag me through it. <laughs> I was, <and> messed up. <laughs> I was <laughs> just yeah. dragging behind. It's like, well, if I, if, <laughs> if I, there was a chance to redo that, how would I do that now? No, right. I'm older now and I have more experience and mm-hmm. like, how would I walk myself through it? Since mm-hmm. I don't, I can't really go look backwards and be like, I really love how my parents did that with me. Mm -hmm. So then I get to decide how I want to do that for myself, Mm -hmm. you know, and I have, I have a responsibility, especially as a parent. And we have responsibilities when we work in the mental health field or when we're teachers or wherever it is that we're coming across people who are hurting, or we have access to a lot of kids or a lot of, Mm -hmm. um, you know, people who are counting on us or looking at us with the eyes of like, you're here to teach me. I expect Mm -hmm. you to teach me. Um, I just approach most situations with death um, to be my greatest opportunity to learn about Mm -hmm. who I am as a person and to understand human nature and to understand dynamics between people. Mm -hmm. And I know, I mean, I'll go back to it one more time, but like one of my favorite 
for lack of a better word, things to do at a funeral um, is to watch how other people are grieving. Mm. You know, especially mm. when I'm like, I know the family, mm. but I'm really kind of showing up to the funeral, like as my, to pay my respects and to show this family, you you don't have to grieve by yourself. Like mm. I'm here, but maybe, it, you know, maybe I'm really connected to the person who's the spouse, but I didn't really know the, the husband who had died mm-hmm. super well, but the wife is a person who I've known for a long time. And I'll sit in the funeral and kind of watch the wife because that's what I think might be coming next for me. Mm-hmm. You know, or watching the parent who lost the child, or watching the sibling, you know, sitting looking at the casket. You get of their a window sibling. into their experience. Yeah. And, and and I can pull all the lessons. And you're an empath too. And you out have of the, it. Yeah. You can, I, I feel like, yeah, I can look at, I can look at those things. And I felt like that with my patients too. And some of their stories where it was a window into their life and, and what happened. And society and, and everything to make this the situation right yeah. now, and, and but, then it and then it's kind of also I mean Kaylee, it's like what do we view as beautiful? Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I think deep grief is one of the most beautiful expressions of love there is mm-hmm. on the planet. Mm-hmm. I know. Well, there's such a, like a and when you're in deep in it, there's such a there's a weird like calmness too about it there's a weird like understanding about it i remember when chris died like the day of maybe like i remember one of my friends had came come over and the first thing i said to her was some of us have to die so others can live and i had this moment where i could just see my life where i had attempted suicide before and i struggled with depression my whole life and how right then i'm not the one that's supposed to die and it's Ooh. <laughs> and that's a lot, right? That's a lot to face in the in 19 years old having that thought or whatever that is. But there was, there was something so beautiful to that. It's like, yeah, maybe this doesn't fucking make sense. And this is weird. And this is complex. It's so much more complex than I un- can understand. But, but knowing under, I guess knowing that I don't know why and, and hoping I'll understand at a later date. And you will. And I remember pulling up to your house the day that Chris died and you and Elise were in the yard just laying in the grass. (laughs) (laughs) And I remember as I was driving up like, okay, well, I don't know what's about to happen. (laughs) You know, we all uh, just ended up in the front yes. yard, just in so a the, big old circle. And I was like, okay, apparently we're going to lay in the grass. So uh-huh. I just remember joining y'all. Well, I went laying, needed to be outside, but mm-hmm. he had in the, backyard. in the backyard. Yep. <laughs> so we didn't want to go in the backyard. Yep. So just, just the and then there circle. ended up being like 20 something young people mm-hmm. just laying in your front yard crying talking holding each other confused like wrestling with the why or I mean, what, how many uh, people I mean, dropped everything that day you know what i mean i know it was a friday how many people called into work how many people left work how many people yeah. dropped everything and showed up yeah. and felt with me yeah. i think that's the purest bit of love is feeling pain for somebody else and I, I don't think I could have gone through any of this had I not had the wonderful people in my life to help share my pain. That's the hardest part about grief Absolutely. is sharing pain. And it's hard and you don't want to do it, right? Because you already got your own shit and you got to deal with that. But being able to sit there and feel somebody else's pain and literally, I think, take some of that load off is the most beautiful thing form of love right i agree i 100 percent agree and that and that is what i strive to do and that's what i want to show other people we can do and i how much more stronger could we be as society and as a community if we could help each other in that way right if we can sit with each other in pain yes. and feel it for each other and feel each other's happiness and feel it all together right if we can in, in our own way, 
um, nurture a community of those professional grievers, those professional whalers, you mm. know, people who like feel it deep in them. And maybe it's because it's been passed down from generation to generation. Like they've witnessed it in their own families and they've had all these personal experiences or because they have a curiosity towards it or because life has thrown a whole bunch of shit at them um, that has turned them into these experts. Mm. But we've got to like organize ourselves yeah. and we have to show up for people. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I have an urn that's right there. You see the green one? Mm -hmm. So every time a person that I know has passed... Um, I do a private ceremony for mm -hmm. them. Just It's just me. Mm -hmm. It's just me with my own thoughts and feelings. Mm -hmm. And I tend to write about them. A lot of what I write, I send to their family members. Because it's like, you know, mm -hmm. I would imagine that if I lost my mom or if I lost my son, and every now and then someone sent me a handwritten letter of their favorite stories about that person, mm -hmm. like that that would just be like I mean, it, it's just a new, sunshine for myself. Yeah, it's a new nugget of something that you didn't even know Yes, existed. this other perspective You're like, of who oh my were. God, they're, they're still living on on because yes. there's another story I haven't heard. Yes. You know? So that's part of my process sometimes, and it's just good and healthy for me. And then I write their name on a um, flash card, and then I do like a private little ceremony. The ceremony's never the same because it's, mm -hmm. you know, depending on who the person was and what my connection was to them. And, um, and then I put their name in that urn. And so at on Day of the Dead, I bring take that out home. and take a look at it and honor all of them and say prayers for their families, especially for their parents or their children um, and spouses. And I light a candle for every person whose name is in there. And when I can, I have a picture and I add pictures to my altar. God, there's got to um, be so many names. It's a lot. <sighs> yeah, it's mm -hmm. a lot. But it's healing for me. Yeah. Every year it is healing for me. That's mm -hmm. why Day of the Dead is my favorite holiday because it is like that holiday is not about mourning that holiday is about celebrating right and we need to stop thinking about you know all of these uh people that we lose as little holes right they're not little mm -hmm. holes we're built of them we're made of them absolutely so they can live on through us and i can my i can do more with my life because i have i know their love and I can live with that, you know, just thinking about, I mean, every Annabelle, Danielle, I mean, <laughs> Xavier, just, I mean, everybody I've known and as such amazing, beautiful people, right? Who have taught you so much about taught. who you are, who have taught me mm -hmm. so much about who I am. Yeah. yeah. And how important it is that we continue to talk about it. And part of what Day of the Dead does is it doesn't let us go that long, you know, because it's, it's a celebration every year without telling those stories. Yeah. Like without bringing their memory back up, mm -hmm. like without rebirthing, mm -hmm. like this is why this person was important to me. These are the greatest lessons that they taught me. Here's what they taught me about love. Here's what they taught me about family. Here's what they taught me about courage, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Here, here are the mistakes that they made that I've learned from, right. you know, so that it, well, th those mistakes won't, you know, just be these things that happen that no one learned from. Mm -hmm. Um that's why I love Day of the Dead so much. That and the food. I love mm -hmm. making food in memory of people. <laughs> yeah. It's the fat boy in me that just yeah. loves making food, food in memory of people. Plus, I just, food is comfort for me. Oh, yeah. That's like the best comfort thing. Your casseroles have comfort, comforted me and my family so many times, you know? But. One, one, uh, one thing I'm thinking about doing, so now I'm going to have to do it. Um, one of the things that I talked about with Bill and your mom just a few weeks before he died was um, I was asking him, like, what are the smells? If, if the house could smell like anything, what would he want it to smell like? And he was telling me about these cookies that he would bake every holiday, mm -hmm. chocolate chip cookies, and then he'd put, I think it was almond M&Ms mm -hmm. in the batter, and then he would bake those cookies. So I think I'm going to make a batch of those cookies oh, sweet. To, yes. surprise, to surprise your mom, yes. especially as we're approaching the holidays, because oh, yeah. this will be, be the first holiday that your family's having to go through without Bill. Mm -hmm. It'll be and really he was different. like a big, I mean, he, he fried our turkey, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> what are we going to do? <laughs> Man, it's and it's sad too to look and and see how our family has dwindled. <laughs> Looking at the pictures right now, but it's but it's also yeah. We can what what did we learn and how can we have to give it reason, right? We have to give it purpose. We have mm -hmm. to give it something. And I think the more I give it to that to that, and I let 
the things they taught me and that I learned from them shine through me and I and I live by them and I live by the principles that they mm-hmm. that they that I respected about them and then I start to become a person that I I respect yes. you know yes because I'm made of all my favorite little bits of my of all of my these favorite people. people exactly yeah exactly there um there are times where we are confronted with things that can be life-changing, soul-changing. And I believe that death is one of those great lessons and great equalizers. Mm-hmm. And my hope and part of why I've dedicated a piece of my life to this um, is to grow that and nurture that in the next generation that's mm-hmm. coming up and how I interact with my son around death and dying and the way that I talk to my parents about death and dying and the way that I believe personally about death and dying. Um, I think if more of us spoke openly about it, um, helped other people see the balance of the mourning and the celebrating, mm-hmm. if we did more traditions, if we kept more ceremony, um, if we sat with people, mm-hmm. those moments are sacred. Yes. They are literally sacred. And we are starving for it mm-hmm. as a community. We are. Well, I, as we wrap up here, I just need to acknowledge how you have been that for me in my life for all of it. So, I mean, being there from the, from the first one till, till now, and you have, been there every step of the way and one of the only people that could get through my thick skull as a teenager (laughs) and reason with me um but i mean yeah yeah i mean you've definitely you've been an absolute godsend my life and i'm so grateful to know and love you and still be able to do stuff like this and (laughs) um you know and what an honor it's been to watch you grow as a person and you're in my life the way that I'm in your life. Mm-hmm. So, you know, mm-hmm. it's a reciprocal soul to soul connection mm-hmm. that I feel with you, Kaylee, uh, that I always have. Always have. Yeah. Yeah. Watching you walk through some really, really dark things as a person and watching you do it kind of effortlessly. And I don't mean easy. I just mean, I, um, people always say I just mean <laughs> with your, with your mind and your soul aligned. That's been really cool to watch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Always been a tough cookie. <laughs> and I say we dedicate this podcast to Bill Cooper and mm-hmm. the amazing life that he had here on earth and the way that he'll continue showing up and slapping us around and <laughs> providing us with guidance and wisdom and humor. Mm-hmm. Um, and I knew he was not going to die while the Astros were still in the playoffs. I was like, Woof, this is going to be a long road. We got yeah. quite a bit of time left. Uh-huh. Um, so I imagine that um, he's probably pissed as hell that the, the Rangers won. But. <laughs> yeah. He's probably up there right now. Pissed He's got a lot it. to say. He's talking to customer service. <laughs> um, what the hell? <laughs> and I think maybe this is one of the most beautiful ways that you and I can give blow him a kiss from heaven is mm. to um, to have his passing inspire us to do this. Yeah, absolutely. I and that's. I mean, maybe people don't know, uh, understand why I was like, I got here and I was like, I got to get to work. I have to share, I want to share the rawness of it. I want to share the beauty of it. I want to share uh, the honesty of it because it, it matters. And it's, it's just, it's my truth and people are going to have their own truths, but I just, it's okay to feel how you feel. And it's okay to not understand your, why your gut's telling you something and to go with it anyway. Yeah. Um, and it's okay to sit quietly with people while they're emoting and it's okay to show up to that funeral when you're not sure what it's going to be like or what it's going to stir up in you. And it's okay to send that text with that message that you've been, it's been like nagging at you Mm -hmm. to send to this person because you're thinking about them. And if we can just get out of our own way. You know, with being like, but maybe I won't say the right thing or maybe I won't do the right thing. Like, but if you're doing it with your heart open and you're approaching that situation out of love, you're going to be fine. I think we, we deep, 
deep down know what the right thing is. And I think the more we fight it, the worse we feel. And sometimes even the wrong thing, Mm -hmm. (laughs) the wrong thing, so to speak, like that's still an act of love. Mm -hmm. You know, it's showing up that is so important. Showing up, showing up when you need to show up. And that is something Bill always did. Absolutely. He always said, suit up and show up. He He was great at that. mm -hmm. He showed the fuck up for us so many times. And I hope, and I am so grateful I was able to do that in his end. And I hope that I can continue that on. R.I.P. Bill Cooper. We love you. We love you. Thank you so much for doing this with me. I love you. I love you too. Oh, yeah. Ooh, girl. Uh, how do you feel about death right now? I'm not afraid of it. You're not afraid? No. I'm a peace, Kaylee. Yeah. Yeah.